Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here today with Think Tech Hawaii, and we're going to be talking about some global issues. We're very fortunate to have Nilafer Aral with us, who's from Bilgi University in Istanbul. And she is an expert on international law, international environmental law, and international ocean law. Uh, she and I have actually worked on some projects together relating to uh, international law. And she is uh, a part of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And she will be here for the big World Congress that we're going to be having starting September 1. Uh, rumor has it that even the President of the United States will be coming. Uh, Nailifer is what they call the Western European Counselor, and she's also Chair of the Academy at the IUCN. So I thought maybe, Nailifer, you could help us uh, understand, uh, give us an idea of how IUCN works, and what does that mean that you're a Western European Counselor? Well, thank you, Sherry. It's really delightful to be here today. And I think as the IUCN, we are very excited about having the Congress in Hawaii. Uh, the Congress happens every four years. And as you may know, we're expecting a record 10,000 delegates to this Congress here. The IUCN is one of the oldest and perhaps the largest conservation organization in the world. It is devoted entirely to the conservation of nature. Uh, and you have uh, you have a, a secretariat of a thousand people and 16,000 people around the world experts in different areas of international uh, conservation issues, international law, science. You're also a member <laughs> of the Commission on Environmental Law. So the work of the, the IUCN is very uh, important and, um, and we think that uh, the Congress is where uh, the members uh, can uh, promote conservation issues. So I don't know if you want me to get into the details of how it all works. Well, first uh, I want you to explain to us what that means to be a Western European counselor and how do you get that position? All right. And what are your duties as, uh, okay. as, a, as a counselor? So the IUCN is not your regular NGO. It also has a component that is what we call the uh, members assembly and you have commissions mm -hmm. and you also have the secretariat and the governance is composed of a president who is elected by the members uh, you have a director general who is appointed and then you have the councillors and the councillors are elected from the different regions and I'm from the region of Western Europe and we are three councillors from the Western Europe so after the members assembly and they are the members of the IUCN, which include government members and NGO members. Uh, they are, of course, the highest uh, governing. They're the final decision maker, <laughs> but we come before that. <laughs> well, maybe just because we're here in Hawaii and we're so far away from Istanbul, I think we must be at least halfway around the world from you. Uh, maybe you could explain why is Turkey considered to be part of Western Europe? <laughs> <laughs> I think that goes back to the Cold War days, that's why. Oh, is that why? Yeah, that, okay. is, that is, and it's based on the uh, UN classification. So, the, because the IUCN dates from 1947, it's quite old actually. Mm -hmm. um, so Turkey was put in the Western Europe based on the UN classification. Because Turkey's both in Europe and Asia. It is, we're a Eurasian country. Yeah. We are literally a uh, cultural mm -hmm. and land bridge. Uh -huh. between Asia and Europe. So I live in Istanbul, and I tell people I'm an intercontinental commuter because <laughs> uh -huh. I, I live in Asia and I work in Europe, so absolutely. So what do you do as chair of the academy? So yeah, the, the, so the IUCN has different components, and we represent the educational component. And the academy, the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law, uh, is composed of uh, association of almost 200 universities, including the University of Hawaii. So we're very pleased to have the University of Hawaii as a member. And these are universities, law schools in particular, actually, uh -huh. that uh, teach, do research in environmental law. And we are global in every continent, from Africa to Asia, Oceania. And basically, we promote um, research, teaching, and environmental law. Is that what the academy does? It does, exactly. I see. 
Well, uh, and then you were talking about the um, uh, Environmental Law Commission. So maybe you could just give a brief explanation of what that is, because of course you're chair of the Environmental Law Commission as well. Well, uh, no, <laughs> I'm chair of the Ocean Specialist Group. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Antonio oh, Benjamin yeah. is chair of the oh, okay. uh, World Commission on Environmental uh -huh. Law. So the IUCN, the IUCN is composed of two components. You have the Secretariat, these are the permanent, um, uh, they do the everyday work, and the headquarters in Switzerland and other parts of the world. Then you have the commissions. And one of the commissions is the Commission on Environmental Law. And the commissions are composed of experts but volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have right now in the commission some 900 members actually from around the world. And that's what's important. And as yourself, these are experts in environmental law who are recognized and also willing to give their time uh, to promote uh, environmental law, either through working with governments, uh, helping with publications, uh, and this. So. so at the World Congress, uh, the Environmental Law Commission is going to have a panel, is that correct? Actually, we have a legal journey. Okay. So what it is, because you know, as I said, there's 10,000 delegates coming uh -huh, to the uh -huh. Congress. There is uh, over a thousand events going on at this Congress. Wow. So what they've done is they've divided it up into different thematic journeys. And one of them is going to be the legal journey. And the Commission on Environmental Law is involved in several uh, different panels there. But as the Ocean Specialist Group, we will have a panel on uh, the specific issue of protection of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, meaning the high seas. I see. And, um well, what does that mean? Why should we be concerned about protection of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction? Uh, what is the reason for having a panel like that? And what kind of discussions do you expect the people will be talking about? So um, many people don't realize that most of the ocean is actually in an area that is unprotected because it falls beyond this legal jurisdiction of the coastal state. And uh, what came about over the past, you know, couple of decades is that marine biodiversity, fish stocks, habitat, the coral reefs, uh, are really being destroyed by many reasons, from less pollution but more human activities, in particular uh, fishing activities, and now we also know about deep seabed mining. So a group of um, NGOs, and I have to say IUCN was extremely active in this, have been promoting uh, protection of this area of the high seas, and particularly the idea is to be able to create marine protected areas. So after a decade of hard work, uh, finally governments at the United Nations agreed to start negotiations, preparatory negotiations, of a possible new international treaty that would actually protect uh, biodiversity in the high seas primarily through the creation of high seas marine protected areas. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, the uh, negotiations will be taking place at the same time as the <laughs> IUCN Congress, uh -huh. uh, but it's very important. It's at the UN and nations hopefully uh, will eventually uh, agree to adopt uh, a treaty, an international treaty, that will protect the very vulnerable uh, marine life that lives in the high seas. So um, the IUCN has a special status at the United Nations, isn't that right? Special recognized status. That's right. We're the only uh, organization that's involved in conservation that is, has a, an observer status. So we actually have a permanent representative at the IUCN, which is very important because we then are able to really promote the interests of conservation uh, at the UN. And, um, and for example, I know I've been attending the first uh, preparatory committee meeting they had on this high seas protection of uh, marine biodiversity. And I've seen that the IUCN has had a very strong voice, has been really a leader in this. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that the, that the IUCN, because the IUCN is a, net, it's a union of many, many NGOs. So we represent you know, collectively that voice. 
So that special status of being recognized by the United Nations, which gives the IUCN permanent observer status, um, isn't that the same kind of status that, for instance, the Vatican has and the palace, the palace, the nation of Palestine has? And they both also permanent observers. Yes, they? yes, yes, yes. So. And so, are they involved also in the treaty negotiations? Uh, well. <laughs> They are, yes, they are, but it's really going to be governments who will be um, having the final say because yes. they're the ones that can actually adopt the, the treaty. But yeah, so the, the position of being an observer is very important. So you are a, um, you are representing, you are on the Turkish delegation though to the BBNJ, the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Negotiations, and you've been intending the meetings as a member of the Turkish delegation. Uh, so what, what are your observations of how the meetings are going <clears throat> and the contribution that IUCN is making? Yeah, so I was uh, able to participate as an official uh, member of a state delegation. And I was, uh, it was the end of March and April that they had the first preparatory committee. I was very impressed. Uh -huh. um, the states definitely are committed to this. Um, and I have to say that many of us walked away with a very positive feeling yeah. that, that the states are taking the matter of protection of biodiversity in the high seas quite seriously. And it's, but there are, uh, shall we say, obstacles along the way. Mm -hmm. States are very jealous of their sovereignty. Mm -hmm. The high seas is an area where generally we're talking about sovereign states um, so it's not easy, but I yeah. think um, they're definitely making uh, good headway. So I'm optimistic, but there's still a ways to go. Yes, of course. Okay, and um, uh, you know, so when you go as a member of a delegation to an international negotiations like that, how many, how many people are there from, from Turkey, for instance? How many people are part of the negotiating team? And is there backup research help? So, well, you know, this is a preparatory committee meeting for, you know, I, I think it depends on the countries. So we won't necessarily go by Turkey. Um, so each country will have, you know, uh, its own delegation. Uh -huh. These are preparatory meetings, so they may not be as, as large. Uh, but, of course, you have to be prepared. I tell you, the EU has been um, uh, really a very important player. They've, they've developed some important policy papers shaping the negotiations. Yes. And I think the EU was very key in, in setting the tone um, to promote this because there were certain countries, and I won't name them, mm -hmm. um, who were a bit hesitant. Maybe I should be the United States, for example. But even the United States has taken a much more... Um, positive approach uh -huh. to this. So. Okay, so we're going to take a break right now to hear from our sponsors and uh, thank you so much Dr. Oral for sharing your valuable time with us while you're in Honolulu. Thank you Sherry very much, it's a great pleasure. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kauilucas.com, and also on Think Tech's. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here. I know you're bored this summer. You're just sitting at home, figuring out what to do, go to the beach, spend some time with Think Tech Hawaii. Spend the time thinking about how you can contribute to Hawaii and making it a better place to live. And start watching some of the programs on Think Tech, including Stan Energy Man, where you'll learn all about everything energy, especially hydrogen and transportation. So we'll see you every Friday at 12 o'clock noon. Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha.
Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Aloha and welcome back everybody. Uh, we have the great honor and privilege of having Dr. Nilafer Aral with us all the way from Istanbul, Turkey today. And she is a professor at Bilgi University there. And uh, she and I have had the opportunity to work together on many different international law and international ocean law projects. And I'm so pleased to have her with us today. Uh, Nilafer, we do have a call, uh, so we're going to uh, take the call from our, uh, our uh, viewer. Sherry, very nice, uh, very nice show, and we really enjoy uh, hearing about this. But you know, it brings to mind, um, it brings to mind COP21, which took place only a few months ago. And I wonder if your guests could uh, compare and contrast the events uh, at COP21 and tell us which one is more significant politically, um, you know, which one had as greater clout around the world for conservation and climate change. How does this compare now against COP21? Uh, so the question relates to COP21 and, uh, you know, that negotiations just got over and how does the BBNJ negotiations relate to COP21? Which, which is more important? Uh, and which do you expect to produce more for those of us who are very concerned about the conservation of nature given the climate change crisis and the uh, overutilization of resources of the earth and the lack of sustainability that uh, we are all fearing for the future? Well, thank you for that question, actually, because I had the great um, privilege of attending the COP21, participating in it as a negotiator, actually. And I've been following the negotiations for climate change uh, since Copenhagen, 2009. Mm -hmm. So the question of comparing the BBNJ issue to the climate change is a bit difficult because the climate change negotiations um, was, a, was a very tough negotiation. And, and the reason is that climate change issues impact everything in the sense that it was also the economic infrastructures of countries, energy infrastructures of countries. And it also, of course, uh, has a huge impact on nature as well as we know and oceans. Um, so if I were to compare it, and it's hard because the BBNJ is just starting, but the climate change was extremely challenging very difficult and I think um, the Paris Agreement um, is a product of, of the difficulties that states had uh, and it's an important agreement. The BB&J is, 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 is a much more defined issue. It will not have the same cross-cutting impact on our economies and the infrastructure that the, that the climate change agreement did. But it's, it's extremely important BB&J because we don't know, people don't realize how much we depend upon the oceans. Mm -hmm. Life comes from the oceans, and our oceans are dying. Uh, the UN came up with its first global report on the oceans, and the situation is dire. So uh, I think that in the sense that both are extremely, climate change and oceans are very related. Um, and, and the climate is impacting the oceans, but the oceans are in a very poor state. So states have to take responsibility. And I'm hoping that with the BBNJ that they'll be willing to take on more than they were willing to do a little bit with the Paris Agreement. It is a modest agreement, but an important one, the Paris Agreement. Whereas the BBNJ is about just, you know, creating protected areas. You know, and I think we should be able to do that. So I do appreciate that question. Well, that's really what the IUCN is interested in, is trying to create more protected areas and trying to protect uh, species that are at risk. So how does the IUCN go about doing that? Maybe you just could explain what the red list is and the different kind of lists that the IUCN uh, makes up. I think that from what I've been able to observe that there's a lot of respect 
for the list that the IUCN uh, does develop and because there's a lot of respect, it, it really does help in improving uh, a protection for these different flora, fauna, animals. Absolutely. The IUCN was a pioneer in many um, issues related to conservation. As I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's the oldest conservation organization. And one of the products, you might call it, has been the Red List, the famous Red List, which just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And the Red List basically uh, is by so it's a list that's created by scientists. And the IUCN is very much a science-based organization as well. They have world-renowned scientists who give their time and their knowledge to identifying uh, all living species that are endangered or threatened. That's the red list. And now they've also created this red list of ecosystems, because we also know that you just simply can't focus on one particular species, mm -hmm. um, that everything is interrelated, and the ecosystem is also important. And we're also hurting our ecosystems. Um, so the IUCN, through science-based, um, has created also, for example, the IUCN pr provides the Secretariat to Ramsar. It's one of the oldest conservation uh, agreements for the protection of wetlands and birds. Mm -hmm. And so the IUCN was very instrumental in actually drafting, preparing that uh, international treaty back in 1972. The IUCN also plays a very important role in the uh, World Heritage um, uh, convention, which identifies uh, places of universal value, value, which includes nature as well. It's just not t uh, ancient sites made by humans, but there are also, also marine, marine, That's right, areas marine areas. Marine areas, exactly. That, are world that is, there are marine areas, heritage sites. So the IUCN for decades now has been working actively in preparing international treaties, but also working with governments, helping them to you know, develop their capacity, develop their scientific capacity, their knowledge capacity, working with them to protect as well you know, their natural ecosystems uh, that we all benefit from, actually. So in protected areas is one of the key areas of work. We have a commission specifically for that, for Protected Areas Commission. The IUCN has, a, like the Congress, a huge Congress every 10 years just on protected areas, and they had one uh, a year or two ago uh, in Sydney. And again, 6,000 mm -hmm. you know, delegates from around the world came together just for uh, protected areas. You know, and this is one of the key mechanisms that the IUCN promotes and also contributes to. Wow. Well, I can see why the IUCN would have a big role to play at the BBNJ negotiations because that sounds like this is exactly the kind of thing that IUCN uh, is looking to promote and to have more of. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, is of great concern in the area, uh, in the BBNJ area, of course, is fish, uh, with, as well as in uh, exclusive economic zones of countries within their jurisdiction. You know, and here in Hawaii, of course, we have uh, wonderful uh, different kinds of tuna, and uh, we are very fortunate to have the big eye tuna, yellowfin tuna, and, and other kinds of tuna here. But as we know, they are at great risk. And one of the problems is not just our own fishing people that fish out of uh, Honolulu Harbor, but also the problem of illegal fishing. And you and I worked on a case uh, representing IUCN uh, before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which related to international illegal fishing. And you were able to be the person um, selected to argue, make the oral argument at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So how did that come about? How, how, why did IUCN get to be a party in a case that involved uh, different states arguing about what and who had what rights and obligations to control illegal fishing. Yeah, that um, was a very important case, and it was really wonderful that we got to work together as well on that. So the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is the tribunal that was created under the Law of the Sea Convention. And one of the um, 
mechanisms, and I won't go into the details though, mm -hmm. uh, that states can bring what are called advisory opinions. That means they're not asking to resolve a dispute, but, but they're seeking the advice of the court. And in this case, um, it was the South uh, African uh, Regional Fisheries Management Organization who lose billions of dollars uh, f from illegal fishing in their EEZs, their exclusive economic zones. So they applied to the tribunal uh, to find out what are our rights? You know, what can we do against these countries who are allowing their vessels to illegally fish in our waters and causing us to lose billions of dollars? Uh, and so they brought this advisory opinion before the tribunal. Now, because the IUCN has this special relationship, uh, it is considered to be an intergovernmental organization. And I think because of the work that we had done previously, um, the tribunal knew the IUCN, respected, I think, the work that the IUCN does, and invited us to submit a written uh, memorial and also to argue the case. So we were the only organization that's involved in conservation that was allowed to do that, actually. Uh, and it was a great privilege. I was one of the three members of the team. And I think we made history. We were the first all-female team in an international <laughs> case. And I have to say that uh, we were very happy with the outcome. It had to do about what the responsibilities of the flag state is. And the, the tribunal gave an excellent opinion and adopted, I think, some of the views of the IUCN definitely on that. But there's still a lot that has to be done to stop IAU fishing. I don't know if people realize that, but the situation in Somalia, the Somalian piracy, um, is linked very much to these fishermen, you mm -hmm. know, small, small fishermen who lost their livelihoods in Somalia because of illegal or pirate fishing. So it is a huge problem um, that we have to do. So this is one step, and this was an important case. And I think the tribunal did an excellent job. Well, of course, uh, in that case, uh, a lot of those countries in Africa that brought the case are very small countries and they have they don't even have a Coast Guard or if they do they only have one or two yeah. ships so the people in the Pacific the Pacific Islanders they experience the same kind of inability to police their own waters so I thought that was the most important thing that we that the IUCN did in its brief which was to really urge that the flag state would actually have responsibilities and that uh, there could be recourse to go to the flag That's right. state. Yeah. Well, what was very important, and I think, and in fact, the next step, and I think, you know, as you say, the Pacific Island states. Yeah. Uh, the next step is not just an advisory opinion, because the the tribunal did say that um, these flag states do have a duty to ensure that their vessels are complying with the laws of states, and if they don't, they're liable. Yes. That means they have to pay. Yes. And we're talking big bucks, yes. actually. Yes. But most important is to stop this illegal fishing. So I think that, you know, I think it's time for some, perhaps, litigation on this. <laughs> well, in the United <laughs> States, there was the case of uh, lobster fishermen uh, poaching in the waters of South Africa and selling the lobsters in uh, Manhattan, and they were fined $28 million. So that's the kind of thing there you we go. have to see. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I'm sorry to say that we're at the end of our show, Mila Fur, yeah. and I really appreciate your coming on and sharing your vast knowledge and experience in international ocean matters and also international environmental matters. And we're really looking forward to the World Congress here in Hawaii and appreciate your giving us some insight into how the IUCN works. And so thank you very much, uh, Think Tech Hawaii, and uh, we'll see you again soon, I hope.